Hello, everyone. I'm just looking for a second to see some familiar faces, participants, hosts. I see Eddie, I see Wade, I see Sarah. Sarah, Sarah, Amy. Zachary, Wendy, Rachel, Sandra, Emily. Beautiful. So welcome to Mindful Poetry Moments. Uh, Zachary, thank you. So Zachary is our closed captioner. Um, Ro, we'll get you set up, Zachary. So those of you who could use the services of closed captioning, you just have to, in a couple seconds, Ro's gonna set it up. So you'll be able to utilize the closed caption on the bottom of the screen. Um, our format, for those of you who may be new, or just a reminder, is that we start off our time with a meditation to help ground us in the moment. And today we have Sonia Verma, who resides in the Cincinnati area and who is a amazing teacher and student. And I think the best teachers are the lifelong students. So Sonia has studied and teaches about Ayurveda, mindfulness, yoga, sound healing. So she, um, she's a fantastic colleague of ours. After that, we turn it over to a poet to discuss one of the poems that came from this season of Poetry Unbound. We were going to have Frank X. Walker, a wonderful poet from Kentucky. And uh, Frank sadly had a death in the family so was unable to be here. So it occurred to me to reach out to the poet himself of One Tree, our poem we're studying today, Philip Metris, and he was able to move his schedule around so he could join us today. So we're absolutely thrilled. Little bit about Philip. He's a prof professor of English at John Carroll University in Cleveland as well as the Director of Peace, Justice, and Human Rights at the university. He met Pedrego Tuma five years ago in Belfast, and I think they have similarities and they're both interested in the intersection of poetry, social justice, and reconciliation. So we're delighted to have Philip here. Philip will talk about the poem, give us a prompt, we will write, and those of you who wish to share can share. And then we'll hear the gorgeous poem again. So thank you, thank you for being here. If you have questions, write them in the chat. And otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to Sonia. Welcome, everybody. I just want to take a moment here. I know that Stacy already had us kind of look to see who's here, but just take a moment and just see if you can scroll down to see who's here today joining us. I know we have a wide diverse group of people. And so just take a moment and if you have your screens, you know, off, maybe if you're open to it, you could even turn your video on for a moment and just kind of notice who's here joining us. Wonderful. And as you're here, I want you to see if you can start to slowly bring that awareness into your body. And the moment I say that, we tend to want to posture ourselves and sit in a certain way, and don't worry about that. I want you to actually notice what type of seat you're sitting on, if there's a backrest behind it, if you're sitting more closer to the ground. And I want you to just, you know, you can allow your eyes to be slightly open or they can be closed. Just notice what is feeling alive for you in this moment. Maybe you start to sense this space in your shoulders or a little constriction in your fingers or in your jaw. You can start to sense that support of your seat and your feet against the earth and the ground. If you're wearing socks and noticing that temperature or sensation 
the texture, what's against your feet at this moment. And just an invitation now, just to notice what is showing up for you in your body, just gently scanning for a moment, nothing that you have to fix or to do. You might start to sense that around the back of your shoulders, your head, your feet or your fingers. And then gently starting to sense into your breath. They say that when we come into this world, we come in with this cry, this deep inhalation. And that when we leave, the last thing we do is we exhale out. And everything in between is a sense of life. And the cycle is continuing in through our breath. And with this curiosity and this openness of just noticing it, that you don't have to shift it, you don't have to do anything, but this mere presence of curiosity of this breath that is here for you. And can you notice it? Maybe from that sensation of temperature, that rise and fall. I want you to invite you to sense into the time in your life where you may have sent a bit of a charge. And what I mean by charge is a little bit of disharmony or conflict. And that's always comes in the space of relationships. It may be a recent situation for you. It may have been a while back. I want you to sense this from the sensory experience and poetry does such a beautiful job about it, especially the poem that we'll be going into today. And so as you're here, maybe you sense it through a person and they come visually into your awareness. Maybe there is this time in your life where there is, you know, you're outside or you're inside and so you notice this through temperature. Notice what is showing up for you in your body. Some of us like to hide. And so there's almost this rounding in of the shoulders or a clenching in our fists. Some of us sense this more up higher in our heart or coming up into our neck. Or some of us have different senses that we don't really understand, but it just shows up for us. I want you to just take this moment and just notice what is showing up for you here in the body, in this experience. And seeing if you can fully feel into it for a moment. Do you feel your heart racing? Or does your mouth feel dry? I want to invite you now to soften a little bit, to give it a little bit of space. Maybe you can step a little bit away from the situation, but it's still there. And that emotion is this energy emotion and that you can still sense the feeling that you have and regardless of right or wrong, you're holding it with the softness and care that you can sense in, sometimes it helps to actually breathe in a little bit into the belly to so help with the softening here of whatever may show up for you here. And as you start to invite this space, maybe you can extend this to the other person or to the situation. Can you hold yourself with a little bit of the softening and gentleness and hold the other person, that they carry their own myopic view of the world, their own hopes and fears, their own stories. Maybe you understand it, maybe you don't. But that you hold it with that gentleness and softness as you're holding yourself at this moment. And as you're here, I want you to sense what feels alive for you in the sensory experience for a moment. What is coming up for you? Gently, I want you to start to come back into your body in any way that feels good, sensing into your feet and your seat. If your eyes are closed, sensing the four walls within your space. You can move into your fingers and your toes. 
any little movements that feel good to you. And I'm truly, truly honored to be in this space today, especially with this lovely, lovely poem by Philip Metris, One Tree. It really does evoke this sensory experience. And I want to hand it over to him and really this lovely reading, honored that you're here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. I was uh, amazed how many times I yawned during the, your uh, meditative reflection, which means that I was relaxing, which is such a great feeling. Even though I was on Zoom, I was yawning a lot, which is so weird. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Stacy, um, for creating this space. It's good to see everyone. We all have our Zoom faces on, which means we're perceiving, but we're not we're kind of frozen in our face and that's just part of the deal. So if you feel a little frozen, that that's okay. Um, I'm supposed to read the poem and then say a few things. Oh, Julie, hi, Julie. <laughs> say a few things about it, um, but let's start with the poem. It's called One Tree. They wanted to tear down the tulip tree, our neighbors last year. It throws a shadow over their vegetable patch the only tree in our backyard. We said no. Now they've hired someone to chainsaw an arm, the crux on our side of the fence, and my wife in tousled hair and morning sweats marches to stop the carnage mid-limb. It reminds her of her childhood home, a shady place to hide. She recites her litany of no returns. Minutes later, the neighbors emerge. The worker points to our unblinded window. I want to say, it's not me, slide out of view behind a wall of cupboards, ominous breakfast table, steam of tea, our two young daughters now alone. I want no trouble. Must I fight for my wife's desire for yellow blooms when my neighbor's tomatoes will stunt and blight in shade? Always the same story, two people, one tree, not enough land or light or love. Like the baby brought to Solomon, someone must give. Dear neighbor, it's not me. Bloom shadowed, light deprived. They lower the chainsaw again. So, um, our dear host has put me in the awkward position of trying to explain my poem, which I'm not going to do, but maybe I'll just say some words around it. And I do highly recommend Padraig Otuma's discussion of it on, on his uh, podcast, um, because he really got at some of the layers beneath this. And that's because in part, he is trained as a mediator. And in this poem, obviously there's a conflict Right there's a conflict between the speaker of the poem and his his family's wife and the neighbors, but what Padraig also observed quite smartly and with a kind of sting about it is that there's a conflict on the in the side of uh, the speaker's family between the speaker and his wife in this case, um, and so there's a greater complexity that emerges from this this binary of self and other or us and them. This poem is actually the first poem in a book called Shrapnel Maps, which uh, is not really explicit in this poem, but becomes a kind of ur text for the, the work of the book, which is trying to think about the predicament of Israel and Palestine and of Palestinians and Israelis and their longing to belong to a place that they both claim and what to do about that. But I thought it would be really good and important to begin with a, my own experience of longing to belong and longing to not be fighting. So one of the things I learned from Padraig's observation about this poem was that, um, that, that is very true about myself, but I had to write it in order to understand it, which is that sometimes my longing for peace comes at a cost. Um, it comes at a cost of relationship. It comes at a cost of a sense of justice. 
And I'm reminded uh, at this moment, as we um, all of us heard the news about the, the case yesterday with Chauvin's con uh, convictions and uh, George, George Floyd's, uh, of, you know, after George, George Floyd's death, his murder, um, and thinking about the, the great need we have for justice um, alongside, you know, what this poem is asking, which is, can we have, can we have peace and justice at the same time? Can we have something like um, something, something in which everyone has a share in, in it? I'm not going to answer that question, but I'm just saying that uh, that me as a person, that the, that the person who wrote this poem and the speaker who is the I in this poem share something which is a deep discomfort with conflict and injustice sometimes requires us to lean into conflict rather than freeze or try to escape it. Um, so these are some things that maybe we should be thinking about. What is our relationship to conflicts? Um, the conflicts of our lives? Are we someone who, who aggresses, right? Are we someone who pushes ourselves in and demands for what we want? Are we someone who concedes and uh, too, maybe sometimes too quickly in the longing for uh, a perceived harmony? Are we someone who freezes, who doesn't know what to do, right? Are we someone who flees from, from that conflict? Uh, sometimes we've been all of these people depending on our relationship to those conflicts, but to become more aware, uh, as, as Sonia did for us, to become more aware of our bodily responses are, 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 um, is, is a way of helping us become more, um, more active contributors to managing and hopefully decreasing the conflicts in our lives and in our larger social and political lives. Um, one of the things that I observe about this poem is that I created, and my wife became sort of the hero of the poem, and I'm, I'm in some sense the villain uh, of the poem, <laughs> and that's fair. <laughs> I think that one, one, things that one of the things that poems can do is they can be honest about our own positionalities and our own sort of failures, as well as to uplift the moments of our you know, moral clarity and courage or the moments of others, moral clarities and courage. Um, certainly as a, as a man, um, I wanted to demonstrate my vulnerability by admitting what, what, is, what is absolutely true that sometimes I will want to flee a conflict um, rather than, um, than to face, to face the, the deep discomfort that comes with it. I'm just gonna stop for a minute. Hopefully, uh, uh, you can be thinking your thoughts as I look at the poem again. So the situation of the poem should be fairly clear. And I imagine in, in the poem prompt that you're going to write, it would be great for us to have a sense of the situation, the literal setting, the physical setting, right? Um, as well as the, the, the characters uh, involved. That is to say, who, who is in this conflict? Um, the conflicts are obviously uh, both external and internal, that they, they involve something happening materially in the world, but they often have a psychic dimension. And, and I think this poem sort of deals with both. Um, one of the lines in this poem that gets a lot of attention is always the same story, two people, one tree, not enough land or light or love. Now, obviously, those of you who've, you know, who know the Garden of Eden story um, or know the book of Genesis know all about two people struggling, you know, whether it's Cain and Abel or Abraham and Isaac, um, or you know, uh, you know, all all manner of conflicts that happened in the Book of Genesis quite quickly, right? Or Adam and Eve and and uh, and uh, the serpent. Um, but I think when I'm reading the poem now, although there is a kind of truth to this 
this utterance, it's also in some ways a kind of rationalization that the speaker is making, which is to say, um, I, am, I am resigned or I don't know what to do. So this connects up to this the story, the tragic story of the limits of our resources, our land, our light, or our love. But love is is the the one that that is part of the rationalization. Of what what why why does the speaker not uh, love in a way that's active, um, and you know act in, in a way love in a way that's active both toward uh, the wife, his wife, and to the neighbor, whatever that looks like, to find some other way than to say that it's always going to be the same story. Um, always the same story, two people, one tree, not enough land or light or love. So I want you to believe that, but also to disbelieve it at the same time. Um, those who don't know the story of uh, Solomon and the baby, um, that is also an allusion to a story in Hebrew scripture in which Solomon, the wise judge, is asked by two women to decide who deserves this baby. Um, and so Solomon says, well, I have a solution. Uh, why don't we cut the baby in two and you each can have half. <laughs> and the woman who gave uh, birth to the baby said, well, then she can have the baby. And Solomon pronounced, then you must be the true mother and gave the baby to her. Um, so that's a story that's sort of embedded in there. Um, some people want to know what happened. Like, what happened? Does lowering the chainsaw mean that they've that they're going through with it to uh, to destroy to cut the tree's branch, or does it mean that they're not going to uh, to use it, use that chainsaw? And I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I think I think. Um, Good poems leave us in that space of the uncertainty um, because it's all about something that's unresolved and maybe unresolvable on some level. Um, that's what I have. Uh, you know, we're supposed to, I'm supposed to talk for at least a, a couple more minutes, but does anybody want to jump in or should we just move straight to the prompt? Stacy, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Can Stacy be unmuted? Oh, I have to do what Ro sends me to do with my thing. Sorry, Ro. <laughs> I saw the button. So how about if we click out of the poem for a second? Um, before we get uh, uh, we'll get to our own writing pretty quickly, but does anyone have a a question for Philip. If you just want to raise your hand, which you can do by going to the reactions and use a little raise your hand. We'll just wait a second to see if there's any burning desire. You have an eager group of writers here, so most of us are ready for the prompt, perhaps. Hands are poised. Or so, keyboards are ready. <laughs> so, Julie, what would you like to ask? Phil, thanks for this poem. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is about form. I wanted to ask you about prose poem and why prose poem, but I'm also like super interested in like the legal implications of the fence <laughs> and them choosing to chainsaw possibly over it if the tree is in the yard. I'm like, because it sounds like they went through with it, although it's kind of a Rorschach test at the end. Like, are you, are you a glass half full, half empty type of person is I guess how you would read whether they saw it or not. But the again, I feel like is, that sounds like they went through with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I also wanted to say like, what I, I wanted to say that like, you know, you said you made yourself the villain of the poem, but also I think being more generous towards you, there's so many layers of like I and authorial self in the poem, right? Because that speaker I is also in some ways the author who comes back and writes the poem and offers 
this you know additional perspective on the experience um and at the very end right bloom shadowed light deprived to me gets to that sort of like not an either or logic of opposition but really like a both and you know they are both bloom shadowed and light deprived and those are like mm -hmm. two sides of kind of the same coin um so anyway yeah i was i was curious about the prose poem um you know being a, a conduit for you know for this story how did the poem find its form why prose poem you know what what would the life of this poem be like you know if it were lineated or something like that mm, thanks julie that's mm -hmm. great great questions um for a, lo a long book such as the shrapnel maps is <laughs> which is 180 pages um i was really seeking for forms that um that would appear differently on the page. And, um, but going back to a previous book, Sand Opera, I was really interested in like the shape of a very tight prose poem that looks almost like a window shape. Um, and uh, because it's a story, it's a narrative poem, it's an anecdote. Um, I wasn't feeling the intensity of a lyric lineation when I was, um, when the poem sort of unfolded for me, I can't remember the precise moment where I said, oh yeah, not a lineated poem, but a prose poem, a vignette sort of. Um, but I think I wanted it to feel like, um, to feel like some something that was easy to enter into but hard to get out of which I think that that prose offers us I, I, I haven't ever put it that way but that that's I think one way of, of putting it um, for some people and I think I was trying to write a book that would be approachable to a wider audience of readers than those who um, are drawn to poetry first I don't know if that's I've been successful in that but that was one of my hopes um, and um, the legal implications are clear. They should not have the right to cut on our side of the fence. But it's interesting how rights and justice and peace are sometimes opposed. I, I actually, I direct a program called the Peace, Justice and Human Rights Program. And I often say that like, there is a beautiful place in the middle of the Venn diagram between these three terms but um, there's a lot of space where they are not connected. And that to me, like in my heart, that's the goal. I think that um, some in the younger generation, um, we, we, ha we have this like amazing rise of what's called sometimes derisively, but sometimes uh, happily the social justice warrior. And I would just ask and invite every social, social justice warrior to not always be at war um, with themselves or the world, but to find ways of, um, to find ways of, you know, being, I don't know, we don't even have terms for it, you know, warrior of light, like, what are we going to call it? Um, you know, a dispenser of love, um, a creator of refuge and space, um, you know, I've spent a long time thinking about peace and how peace is such a, a derided, term because it seems so passive in our culture but wow nonviolence um soul force um, these these are terms these are actions these are ways of being in the world that we need more of um so um you know yeah uh and so yeah I, think, yeah I think we should shift right yeah yeah, I would love that. And I told I let Deborah know that if we have time, we'll get an extra question at the end. But yes, if you could uh, just remind us what the prompt is and Ro will capture it in the chat. Okay, so I am inviting you to write a poem that uh, depicts or dramatizes a conflict. Um, and you may be a character in it, or you may be a witness of the conflict. It could be, you know, between your parents, because that's always a really powerful triangle. Um, it could be between you and a beloved, or you and a, a neighbor, or you and an enemy. But the point 
of this is to have you explore the conflict to sort of build it up for us as a, as a, as a bit of a scene um, and try to do a couple things in there. Maybe have a little dialogue, something that's said by, by one or more of the members of the, um, the parties involved. Um, certainly some description of the scene or situation, like what the setting is like. And um, you don't have to resolve the poem as I, as, or the conflict as I do, but just let us inside of it. And you as a writer, try to figure out how, you know, like as Sonia did so brilliantly, how you know your body may have felt at that moment of conflict or how the other person's bodies may have responded at that moment and see if you can describe them and might it might do something interesting in the poem so conflict one obviously uh one or more people have a little description and setting do try to figure out something about um the, the bodily responses and maybe a little touch of dialogue um in there as well Beautiful, we have our marching orders. So <laughs> I'll set the timer for a little uh, 10 minutes and I'll let you know when we're close and then I'll chime us when we're ready to hear from the group. Thank you so much, Philip.
<clears throat> Pardon me, everyone. We've got a, two more minutes before you'll hear the chimes. Just so you know, if you wanna pull toward your enigmatic non-solution closing of your poem. All right, friends. That was such a potent prompt. I'm so eager to hear your responses. So as a reminder, <clears throat> if you could do two things, if you would like to read. First, you're gonna write in the chat to everyone so that Philip, who's going to basically call out names that he sees in order, is able to see the order of who's signing up in the chat. Second, where you see reactions at the bottom of your screen, you're going to click on raise hand. That's going to allow Ro to easily identify you and unmute you. So go ahead and write in the chat and raise your hand if you'd like to share. And Philip, I'm turning it back over to you. So you'll get to call the names of say, Hadley like and yeah. yeah, Susan, make sure you write in the chat that you'd also like to share so we can keep the lineup straight. Ro will unmute Had. Hi. And I'm going back to my childhood home where loss makes sense. Like always, I knock on the glass and walk in the door. I heard the memory of my mother's you who greet me, soon drowned by my dad's new wives. Oh, hello. You didn't knock? Oh, is that mud on your shoes? I'm reminded this isn't my home anymore. I swallowed down the emptiness. The usual awkward, passive aggressive interactions with the wife had already begun. All the warm memories on entering were like bright lost pennies. Spending time with my father's wife has cost me more than spare change. Afraid of our bonds, she locks dad away in a deposit box, feeling safe knowing right where his loyalty lies, knowing none of this gold is escaping her hands. Dad seems content to be in a little box with his marriage deed. I keep looking for the coins in the pouches of my childhood couch, 
hoping to find a relationship with my father to stuff in my empty pocketbook inside since mom died. I hope one day when I come to spend time with my father, I will feel like I'm cashing in the way I used to, not feel like my skin is a purse with a hole and I'm falling through the lining, falling out the bottom, coins trailing behind me, broke. Wow, thank you. You did such a great job uh, carrying through the, the metaphor of money, you know, and uh, the bright lost pennies. And yeah, that was really powerful. Thank you, Hadley. Um, it's weird. I, I also really like the line of swallow down the emptiness. Um, those kind of physical apperceptions are uh, so, so hard to deal with in the moment, but um, when you name them, it kind of, I don't know, it just allows you to, to not be uh, sort of controlled by them on some level or something. So thank you so much. I they see a lot of nods and hearts, so great job. Um, let's see. Wow, we've had, we have a number of people who'd like to jump in. So I think next was, uh, was Wade. Uh, <clears throat> the cat loves me. She knows that I am interested in her back. She knows that I find her tail beyond intriguing. She shares her tiny white paws with my arm, my hands, the tip of my nose. She loves me no matter what I'm doing. I love my cat. She's interested in my face. She finds my hands beyond intriguing. I share my kisses with her face, her neck, and the tip of her nose. I love her no matter what I am doing. Together we are a mess, my cat and I. She gets in my way. I fail her constantly. What lovely beasts we are. <laughs> wow. It's a June conflict. Uh, together we are a mess. What lovely beasts we are. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah, it's sometimes hard to, like, if you just, in any conflict situation, imagine that you and the other person are just like uh, monkeys, it sort of helps a lot. Like, we're just these creatures. We're just these lovely beasts, these lovely awkward beasts. Thank you so much. That was cool. All right. Uh, Susan. Susan Knapp. Okay, can you hear me okay? Thank you. I'm calling this the price. You name the price of our relationship. Your share of that is 50,000. Does this price include our love? Does it include all the memories, mostly good, some bad? You name the price of your relationship. A little boy wanting to hear that that airplane model you made was great. In my mind, I imagine you looking down with a tear in your eye that it just wasn't that good. You name the price of our relationship by calling me your ex. The hurt little boy wanting his dad to say, you did good. I name the price of my pain with numbers, with numbness and a heavy heart. Mm. Thank you, Susan. Wow. Thank you. You name the price of, of our relationship. That is just such a powerful phrase. Um, and it was so powerful also to have that, like the third person, the, 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 the little boy is being part of that complicated renegotiation and imagining um, the different ways that people are responding to that. So that was really wonderful. Thank you. Spencer. Yes. 
Okay. Yes. All right. It's called uh, Fight Over Love. Uh, dear, your red, your red face is frightening. Those eyes of love, uh, slants, beady eyes. Love was there. What is wrong? Your blood pressure sky high. We lost our love. I saw you with him and I. That's it. Thank you, Spencer. Welcome. Oh my gosh, that sense of the blood pressure. How many people have felt that before? <laughs> uh, and you, when you see something, you know, some, so, you know, your love is with someone else or something like that. That, oh yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Wonderful. Uh, Mary. I don't know if it's Mari or Mary. M A R I, Mary. She was with us for a minute, but then maybe not. Is she still? Uh, sorry, I'm back. Sorry. Okay. Um, Mari, so one second. One second. Sure. If you have, if you have all written in the chat that you'd like to read, it's super helpful for Ro if you also raise your hand, and sorry you do that by going to the reactions. So thank you, and um, Mari, I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Thank you, sorry about the hand. I call this one, it was a question. He called for my help. I rolled my chair to his seat. The office was buzzing as it tends to in the afternoons. Let this be the last tag in today's strings of requests. He asked me to be quiet. It was a question of the work, his. And he said, don't raise your voice. This is my regular voice, no. Quietly, it turned out to be the last drop for me as well. Why? I kept think, thinking, nothing made sense by then. I didn't low, lower my voice. He turned his head, exploring others, and dropped his piece on the table. My hair, my heart skipped a bit. It reminded me of the fights with my cousin when he got stronger as teenager. I looked around. People were watching now. I could only see his veins getting bigger, his face turning blood. I couldn't hear the yelling anymore. Still can't muster what he said. I looked around once more. People kept watching. Hmm. That's it. Wow, thank you, Mari. Um, that's such a powerful, that overwhelming feeling one gets, like you can't hear what the other person is saying because there's so much going on in your body. The heart skipping a beat. And I thought it was really interesting how the, it, it triggered some other past moment and that made it sort of even more uh, difficult to navigate, um, okay. triggering. Thank you, Mari. Thank you. Um, Wow, we have 29 messages, so I'm not sure I'm keeping up. I think maybe Kara, Kara Michelle Pearson might be the, the one next. I think Emily is next. Oh, Emily, I'm sorry. It's all good. There's a lot in there. <laughs> okay, sorry. Let's let's hear Emily, and then we're going to hear Raina. Okay. And I think that might be all we have time for today, but I'm gonna explain how everyone gets to share in some way. So let's start with Emma. Hi. Yeah, we. I love the habit of throwing everything in the chat, but it does make it hard to see who wants to go. Clutching her ankle, rolling on the ground, screaming into my gut, red dirt covering her knees that I've sewn and patched at least twice this season. I'm in front of her and she looks up, suddenly tearless. Maria, she pushed me, I tripped, I fell, I lost my shoe, she's so mean, she meant to. She returns to her screams as I collect a shoe a body length away and take her, her bundle of arms and legs into my skirt. Her screams cease as she puts on shoe, inspects self, discovers herself whole, and she runs again. I would give this child away if it meant keeping her whole. If she were the baby brought to Solomon, I'd choose her intact and flying away from me. 
But around the corner of the house comes a storming, blustering wind of a girl. She pushed me first. She fell over her own legs. Her shoes are too big. Do you raise your voice? Do you ignore the blustering? How do you keep two babies intact? <laughs> nice. Yes. <laughs> I loved how you used the the uh, Solomon quote, and then you, you turned it another direction. Um, yeah, that was great. Huh. And I love the stuttered to dialogue, which seemed to be like breathless. That was really cool. Yeah. So, um, I think that we have Raina next. Okay, hi everybody. So I was gonna to defer to someone else, but um, I'll go ahead and read. Uh, this is called One Blood. We were in the process of dying. The old blood bonds, filling our common artery. She came to take a walk, to talk, she said. We stood there in the stilted air, trees watching our every move frozen beside the tennis courts. The birds and leaves tracked the rise and fall of our chests, breathing. What flowed between the invisible tide of our once familiar eyes. Words belied the mess, the mass die off event taking place between us. Hmm. Like the flock of birds that fell from the sky, suddenly mid-flight. Let's take a walk, she said. I came all this way, but I couldn't shake the stench of death. The side of our sisterhood strewn about like a thousand hollow bone carcasses. I sat back into the passenger seat of my car, urging the dark tinted windows to close off what was left of what used to be us. One blood, two bodies standing alone in the dark. Hmm. Wow. Thank you. There were a lot of uh, people referencing um, the stilted air, the mass die-off event, the tree. I really was interested in the tree watching, watching, um, and such a fascinating poem that brings together sort of the eco side, you know, the sort of climate die-off, and then this. Uh, relationship. I don't know that that was that was pretty masterful. How how did you do that in ten minutes? <laughs> you should see the crap that I wrote in ten minutes. <laughs> that seems to be Raina's specialty, uh, it, as well as um, uh, almost all the folks who come to these gatherings. It's really extraordinary. So. Our time together is both goes so fast, but also the amount of beauty and uh, space that's created within this hour is astonishing. So thank you, everyone. We're going to let Philip read us out in a second, but I just wanted to thank all of our participants. You make these I uh, just lift, all, I think, all of our spirits and hopefully nourish your own so we can be uh, light warriors in the world because my goodness doesn't need it. Thanks to On Being, um, Eddie is here, as well as perhaps some others, uh, Poetry Unbound, Pedrago Tuma, our co-hosts, The Hive, The Mercantile Library, and Wordplay. And we'll be back next week with Manuel Iris, who's just a lovely poet and facilitator, and Troy Bronsink to celebrate another poem together. You're going to get an email from Ro, and that is a way for you to share back with us in a written form your poem that we will put in a blog post dedicated to this particular gathering. And then we'll be letting you know in a few weeks how we can, how you can submit for our second annual 
collection of poems created during our time together during National Poetry Month. So thank you, thank you, Sonia and Philip. And Philip, why don't you uh, read us out with your beautiful poem? Thank you. It's good to spend the time with you. One tree. They wanted to tear down the tulip tree, our neighbors, last year. It throws a shadow over their vegetable patch, the only tree in our backyard. We said no. Now they've hired someone to chainsaw an arm, the crux on our side of the fence, and my wife, in tousled hair and morning sweats, marches to stop the carnage mid-limb. It reminds her of her childhood home, a shady place to hide. She recites her litany of no, returns. Minutes later, the neighbors emerge. The worker points to our unblinded window. I want to say, it's not me. Slide out of view behind a wall of cupboards, ominous breakfast table, steam of tea, our two young daughters now alone. I want no trouble. Must I fight for my wife's desire for yellow blooms when my neighbor's tomatoes will stunt and blight in shade? Always the same story. Two people, one tree, not enough land or light or love. Like the baby brought to Solomon, someone must give. Dear neighbor, it's not me. Bloom shadowed, light deprived, they lower the chainsaw again. Thanks everybody. Beautiful. Thank you so, so much. We look so forward to seeing everyone again next week. And Philip, well, you're welcome to come back with us anytime. We'd love to have you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was that was Phil that was amazing. Yeah, and Philip will <clears throat> for everybody, the email will include information about connecting with Sonia, connecting with Philip and his work and writings so that you can make um, fortify your new connection here. Have a beautiful day, everyone.